Let's go ahead and dive into the Word of God today. Uh, we are in a series called No Ordinary Christmas. We are being challenged to not allow Jesus to become ordinary this time of year. And so last week was our introductory message into that, and it was called No Ordinary Servant. And we were looking at how this Christmas season, we want to, as no ordinary servants, believe for what few do and participate like no one else does. And then when we do those things, then we will see what no one else will. And last week, I considered probably more of an obscure Christmas passage. I know it's right there on the heels in Luke chapter 2 of Jesus being born, but I've always considered this, uh, the account of Ananias, or not Ananias, I'm sorry, uh, Anna and Simeon, uh, one of those more obscure Christian or Christmas accounts. It's kind of at the epilogue of everything that you consider the main points of Christmas, uh, of the Christmas story. That is not the case with this week's scripture text. It is found in Luke chapter 2 and is in the heart of it. In fact, this is what Charlie Brown quoted when he wanted to give what the true meaning of Christmas was. He read and he quoted this right here, Luke chapter 2. Check out verses 8 through 20 with me. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, say suddenly with me. Suddenly. suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This morning, we're going to look at no ordinary worship. We want to give a not so ordinary worship to our King today. Let's pray for the word. Father, we thank you so much for your word to us, your spoken living word. Father, I ask that you will speak uniquely to your people today. Let it be the difference for them this week, I ask in your beautiful name. Amen. Amen. So this act of worship is what you probably would call the most integral part of the Christmas account. It is the culmination of everything that came before. So it only stands to reason that worship should be the culmination and the most integral part of our lives. We all, I mean, we, we throw out that cliche, Jesus is the reason for the season, and if you're really spiritual, you start saying how, well, it shouldn't just be this season, it should be every season, right? And if Jesus is going to be the reason for every season of your life, the culmination of that should be a life of worship for your entire life. The challenging part is this, is making sure that worship doesn't become ordinary. Lord, help us not to let worship become ordinary. And there is a really big difference between worship being routine and worship being ordinary. Worship that is routine means it's part of my life. It's a part of my life. Sure, worship may have its predictable patterns and it may follow familiar practices, but that doesn't mean it's void of power or meaning for me. A routine of worship would, it, it might be scheduled, but because it's scheduled means that there are times where it just spontaneously happens as well. 
because I have regularly provided opportunity for it to happen in my life. And it provides my life with structure, it provides my life with purpose, and it provides my life with fulfillment. Does anybody know how fulfilling it is to worship Jesus? It is fulfilling to worship Jesus. But worship that is ordinary, that means that there's nothing special and there's nothing distinctive about it. It's become commonplace. And so it's become void of what should make worship extraordinary and elaborate in my life. And when worship becomes anything else other than extraordinary in my life, worship will then lose its position of power for my life. You can tell when, well, sometimes you can tell when people have made worship an ordinary aspect of their lives. You can really tell when churches (laughs) make worship just this ordinary thing. I mean, it's usually centered around hymns be honest. I mean, it's usually, I, I love hymns. I, I, I love hymns. There's power. There's robustness. I love hymns. But churches that just refuse to let go of them, it seems to me that it's almost just this thing that, that it's, it's ordinary and we don't want to let it go. Or, or you might talk about the organ. That's not a huge thing in, in our church circles anymore, but there are churches that just won't let it go. And I'm not against organs. I'm not against hymns. I think there's beauty in them. But there's, when a church fails to see the life that can come from worship and they become rigid and inflexible in it and there's no other way for it to be done. It just becomes part of the program because it's the proper thing for it to do so we do it and it's not because we have the privilege and the freedom. It's just because we've always done it that way. Our privilege and our freedom to worship is anything but ordinary. It's anything but ordinary. And I am challenged this morning to not allow worship to become ordinary in my life. Because it's a trap that I can fall into. It's a trap that we can all fall into. Where we can come to church week after week after week and we can sing incredible life-giving song after song after song. And it may be a regular part of my routine, but it will never have the power it's supposed to have in me unless I actively ensure it remains outside of the scope of ordinary. Not so ordinary worship. It's more than Sunday morning. It's for who he is. Not so ordinary worship. It's more than just what he's done for me and thank God for all that he's done for me. But it's for who he is not so ordinary worship. It's not based on what I need. It's because of who he is. Not so ordinary worship. It's not a deposit to ensure I get what I need for this coming week. It's because of who he is. Not so ordinary worship. It isn't dependent upon how I feel. You guys are here that braved the wind and the waves this morning. You know that you probably didn't feel like it, but you're not so ordinary worshipers today. It's because of who he is. Not so ordinary worship. It's not because I have all my ducks in a row, because heaven knows I have no ducks. They're all around this platform here, okay? But it's because of who he is. Perhaps you see a pattern forming this morning. All those things, they they could be true of my life. It might be Sunday, and he maybe has done incredible things for me, and I might have incredible needs in my life, and I, I might have a lot of things that are dependent upon worship being a valuable aspect of my life, but that's not why I worship not what I I produce. The reason why I produce that proclamation from my life, it's because it's because of who he is. This morning, I want to encourage you, don't just let worship become part of the program. Don't let just worship become this proper thing that you do. There's nothing ordinary about this. We worship because we're compelled to. Not so ordinary worship, it's worship that's not coerced externally or from somebody that's up front. Not so ordinary worship is compelled from within because the Spirit of God births it within your heart that there is something that I just have to give. It's this innate desire deep within me that I have to put forth to him what he is due. 
but at some point in our walk, and you know what's going to happen if it hasn't already this week, it'll probably happen this upcoming week, we're all going to be Uh, find ourselves in this ordinary humdrum of daily life that could stifle out that compulsion. So this morning I want to give you three reasons why we're compelled to worship and they also serve as three reasons that will help us remain compelled today. First of all, I remain compelled by what has been explained. By what has been explained. The compulsion to worship always comes because there was an explanation preceding it. The Christmas account is, is bookended with <laughs> explanations that resulted in worship. You, you have Mary, who had the visitation from the angel, and she was explained all that was about to happen. You will conceive, and you will give birth to a son. You'll name him Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be called Son of the Most High. He's going to be given the throne of his fa- forefather, David. And he's going to reign over all of Jacob's descendants for all of eternity. His kingdom will never end. And when she received the explanation, what happens? Worship is her response. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 and 47. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. At the very end of the account, because it's bookended, worship is bookended in the account. It's right when Jesus has been dedicated at the temple and there's Simeon runs into them and he's had that promise. Remember, we talked about it last week. He's had the promise that he's not going to die before he sees the Messiah come. And I don't know how long he's waited. He's waited for a long time, possibly. Maybe it was a week and a half. Maybe he was sick and he knew he was on his way out. I don't know. But he saw Jesus that day and he knew Jesus was the fulfillment of that promise and of that explanation and what does he do it says in luke chapter 2 he picks up jesus that's a kind of a 21st century trigger for some moms in here right he just randomly picks up jesus and says my eyes have seen this and i am praising god because of it the shepherds they received a detailed explanation of what's going on that night look at verses 10 and 11 again It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. Without the explanation, it's just a beautiful sight. It's an incredible sight, an angel that comes and just illuminates the the night uh, atmosphere of that, uh, that time of day. It's a a once-in-a-lifetime experience. It's incredible that they get to experience it, but it's just a purposeless phenomenon. But because the explanation is there, it opens the door for worship. It's the explanation of the gospel that ignites not-so-ordinary worship for our hearts as well. Good news, or gospel means good news. Shepherds (laughs) received good news. I bring you good news. And at some point of our lives, there, there was good news that we received and it was explained to us. Someone came along and they told us about how Jesus' word made flesh. He made his dwelling among us and he was born in a manger. We received good news and we were told about Jesus, the spotless lamb that lived a perfect life that I could never live. And he became the sacrifice that my life needed by being killed on the cross. We were told about Jesus, the resurrection and the life, who experienced resurrection and now is alive. And he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. We we were told about Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, who offers new life to all of those who choose to live for him. And for those of us in this room who follow Jesus, that, that good news, it was explained to us. I was told how I had no hope. I was told about how there was no way out of my sinful nature. I was told how I was eternally lost. But then two words made the, G- the difference. But Jesus, but Jesus, who was it that explained it all to you? Who told you, but Jesus? But Jesus makes the difference. But Jesus is worth it. But Jesus will change your life. It probably wasn't from an angelic visitation. It probably was a pastor. It probably was a parent. It probably was a close personal friend. 
but it's that explanation that has propelled the worship of your heart ever since. And it's not that other things don't come into our life and get explained. Oh, there's so many other things that come into our lives and get explained. You know, the doctor comes in and he starts explaining a report. And suddenly discouragement starts to rise up. My boss comes in and starts explaining a task that I gotta get done. And suddenly stress starts to rise up. Friends come in and they start explaining opportunities. You know what I'm talking about, opportunities. And they're gonna distract me, they're gonna tempt me, they're no good for me. But they're raising up and they're rising up in my life. And all these things have the potential to pull me into ordinary worship. But when I'm determined, I'm determined to be a not so ordinary worshiper, it won't matter what else is being explained to me because the good news is prominent in my life. The gospel is prominent in my life and Jesus gave his best so that I have the opportunity to give my best. It's what I've been explained. It's what I've been explained, but it's not just what I've been explained. I also remain compelled because of what I've been exposed to because of what I've been exposed to. The, the shepherds in our text this morning, they've, they've got a pretty bad reputation, not them individually, just as a class of people. Uh, they, they, their job keeps them from observing ceremonial laws, so especially among like the religious leaders, your Pharisees, your teachers of the law, especially among them, they're, they're social outcasts among their own people. So it's almost ironic that the lowest class of Jewish society among the people of Israel, um, they're now immortalized in the birth of Jesus Christ, the account of that. (laughs) They're just there. They're, They're just out there minding their own business, unsuspectingly keeping watch over the fields at night, over the animals, the very animals that are gonna be used in the ceremonial law that they're prohibited from taking, mind you. And then everything changes. Everything changes. After their initial fear of what it is that that comes before them, the explanation of the angel probably fills them with a lot of questions, but most importantly, a sense of excitement. But then they were exposed to worship, and it changes their lives. Look at 13 and 14. That great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When you're exposed to worship, worship makes a difference in your life. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have to be saved for worship to make a difference in your life. Before Jesus was in our life, we we weren't far off from social outcasts or spiritual outcasts like the shepherds were. We're unable to partake in the glories of heaven because we've been uh, uh, tainted by the sins of earth. But like the shepherds in fields nearby, many of us only heard about something and that intrigued our curiosity, but when we saw something, our lives were changed forever. We we saw what genuine worship looked like. I mean, it it might've been a mother and her silly music. How many of you got some moms that had some silly music? Okay, I heard one of you say it was terrible. None of you had my. How many of you have some kids who think your music is pretty silly? All right, we got some more of the, okay, that that works, all right. Maybe it was a weird guy at church that that they would always erupt into tears in the middle of church. Maybe it was just being in this room with hundreds or even thousands of people united in corporate worship, lifting their voices in their hands in adoration of Jesus. You saw how, how fulfilling and how genuine worship was and could be for that person that you knew. And, and you knew that they didn't have it all together. You, you knew a little bit about them, but that didn't matter. The problems of their life, the significant struggles that they had, it didn't matter because they lived in complete surrender and they worshiped wholeheartedly and it wasn't ordinary. It wasn't ordinary. And it affected everything about them. It affected the way that they acted and affected the way that they would talk. Yeah. And it's made them stick out. And that exposure to worship, it, it, it created a shift in your life. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't instantaneous. It's not like you saw angels in the sky. It was just something progressive that happened. Yeah. That they weren't allow, willing to allow anyone or anything to stand in the way of expressing their love to Jesus. And it still makes a difference in your life today. Yeah. 
when you're exposed to worship, your life changes. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it because it's genuine worship that fulfills the longing of our heart. We're made to worship. We're made to worship. And so it's genuine, when it's genuinely expressed and it's genuinely genuinely seen, it pricks something within us and it itches something within us. And as we're we're uh, exposed to it firsthand, a lifestyle of worship begins to be propagated within our lives. That's why being in church is so important. That's why it's so important. That, that, That corporate worship is so important. I mean, and when you're in a pinch, the online method, because we have a lot of those people that are in a pinch right now. We got a lot of people that are sick or recovering from surgery, and, and that online method, it, it, it covers you in a pinch and in a crunch. But I know some of you know, like Sister Lydia, you used to always tell me, it's just not the same. It's just not the same. It's just not the same. It scratches the itch when you're in a crunch, but it's just not the same because nothing compares to the genuine thing. Zero exposure to corporate worship should never be a routine because it's outside of the scope of ordinary. Worship does what you least expect it to do. It changes you. It may not be, it doesn't limit the truth. It expands the truth in you. Your circumstances may never change because of worship. It may never change. Shepherds, they left the fields, shepherds, and guess what? They returned to the fields, shepherds, that night. But they were still changed. That's what genuine exposure does. It changes you from the worst version of yourself, from the one who is cynical and sarcastic about the things of God to the one that will transform you into your best version of yourself, one who genuinely participates. And that's the third thing I want to talk about today. We remain compelled because worship is sustained by experience. Shepherds received the explanation and the example and it drove them to say, we want to see for ourselves, let's go to Bethlehem. And when they go to Bethlehem and they see Jesus, there's one thing that's left. They need to taste what this thing called worship is all about. And verse 20 says, they returned to the fields glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had just seen, which they had been told. (laughs) One of my Bible fan theories, you know what fan theories are? They're they're theories that are not part of the story that's been been, uh, uh, relayed to you. So one of my Bible fan theories that's not explicitly said in the Bible, but I still believe it to be true, is that this moment here for the shepherds wasn't a one-time event. It was a moment that was repeated throughout the course of their lives. If tragedy struck unexpectedly, they remembered the night that the angel came before them and they erupted into worship. If hardship was abounding in their life, they remembered the baby that they had seen, that they had been told about, and they erupted into worship. Worship always produces more worship. I've shared before, I I tend, I'm so thankful when people bring gifts and things like that for us or our family or me and myself personally, but I'm not one that likes personally consumable gifts, right? You know what I mean by consumable gifts? Food, I'm thankful for it, I'll eat. I usually eat the food. Uh, th- like uh, when I was really young, like if like a hygiene product or something like that, I would find myself not using it because I didn't want it to be used up. I know it's silly and stupid, but it's just the way that my mind worked. I like presents that last, all right? You give me something that's not uh, consumable, that won't be used up, I'll keep it for the rest of my life. Years ago, you guys gave our family a blanket. You probably don't even remember. It was like 10, 12 years ago. You gave our family a blanket. It's this nice reddish maroon color felt blanket kind of thing. I use that thing every single day. It's my blanket on the couch. It's my blanket on the couch, all right? I use it every single day. It doesn't get used up. I use it. Worship is a gift for us. It's not a consumable gift. It's a self-sustaining gift. The more experience I have in worship, not only do I get better at it, not only do I become more comfortable with it, but worship grows within me 
as I become a worshiper. You know the kind of person that you kind of look up to as a worshiper? They're so expressive in their worship. They're, they're so elegant in them. You look at them and you see, oh, how they just love to worship. I wish I could worship like that. It didn't happen naturally. It happened supernaturally as they sustained the experience of worship in their lives for years. When tragedy struck, they remembered who they once were, how they were lost and broken, but then they saw Jesus and they were found and made whole. When, When hardship abounds, they remember how they once acted. They were blind to their sinful ways, but now they can see because of the amazing grace that is in their lives. When, when people fail them, they remember how they used to respond, how upset they would get, how vindictive that they would be. And it's not that they're not affected by people like that anymore, it's just they're now sustained by something more fulfilling than getting back at someone. They're sustained by pouring out themselves to the one who poured himself out to them. Because sometimes all you can do is worship. All you can do is worship. It's a not so ordinary way to live. When stress is so great, when when the sickness has been sticking around so long, when all you can do is change, go go to a certain point, and that's all you can do is is you, you you can change what you can change up to a certain point, and then you can stop because that's all you're able to do, but there's still one more thing at the end of that is you can worship because all you can do at that point is be sustained by that lifestyle. It doesn't come automatically. I like to say sometimes you gotta force it in. I, I, I've, I've heard it said before, you fake it till you make it. I don't believe in that. I believe sometimes though you gotta force it till you feel it. Sometimes you gotta force it until you feel it because often I don't feel like worshiping. But I make the active choice to engage in the not so ordinary worship and I, I, I engage in it, not for what I need him to do, not what I expect him to do, but because of who he is. Worship that's based upon his character and his attributes, and it grows within me. Be in worship every day. If you're here today, most of you normally come to church. You, you understand, but you know people who, who, who they don't normally go to church and they see worship and they're wondering how it is that you can maintain it. It's not the song, it's not the atmosphere, it's the expression of our heart that's been ex- sustained by experience. Some of you, you had to force it this morning. Some of you, you have some incredible things going on in your life and you had to force it this morning. And you forced it in because experience says it's worth it. That, that because, because what has been explained to you, the truth of the gospel, it, it only takes you so far when it comes to worship. When what you've exposed to, it eventually wears off and you gotta get back into the house of God. But it's your active participation in it, your firsthand experience with it that will sustain a life of worship. Allow it build, allow it to build in you. You know, earlier I, said that then the Christmas account worship was the culmination of everything that had come before the culmination of the angels visit to Mary the culmination of Mary and Joseph's relocation to Bethlehem even the culmination of Jesus's birth in the manger it's it all builds up to worship So this morning I wanna ask you, would you look at the events of your life, what's been going on this past week, this past month, this year of 2024? I know some of it's been challenging. I know some of it's probably been liberating. I know at times it's probably been exciting and other times been completely underwhelming. It's probably just this mixed bag of descriptions. 2023 has been an interesting year. And that doesn't matter. Let it culminate in worship this morning. An expression of gratitude, not for who he, what he's done or what you expect him to do, but for who he is. 
for him who is above all things, for him that everything else lives and moves and finds its being. It's not about what you need this morning. It's not about what you want in your life this morning. There's a time and a place for that. There's a time and a place for that. But for this morning, it's about who he is. So don't fall in the trap of ordinary worship as we close out this morning. When circumstances reach a tipping point and you're at church and that certain song plays, be a not so ordinary worshiper this week. Let it happen even if you don't feel it. Because the reason's been explained. You've already been exposed to it. So this morning is time to create the sustainable experience in your life. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? If you're in this place today and worship has been (laughs) something that you can sense in your heart that it's always been special and it's always been impactful. But you can see where there are times. It's not consistent. But there are times where I just do it because it's what I should do or it's part of the routine or it's just the proper thing to do. And This morning you're wanting to break free of that. Maybe you're in that season right now. And it's time just to break free of that. To become that not so ordinary worshiper that just says, you know what, I I have all these things that I need in my life, God. But right now, beyond everything that I need this morning, I just want to say, I want to worship you for who you are. If you're in this place today and you just need to spend some time with Jesus, worshiping him for who he is, would you stand with me this morning? you stand with me this morning? Would you stand with me this morning? You know, worship day is coming in a few weeks, but I want to let you know not to rush this moment and don't try to hold out until then. I know you got things to do this afternoon and there's a lot of busyness in our schedules, but take these few moments this morning and just enter in. Just enter in. Join the angels of heaven that proclaim worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We echo their their cry this morning. As a church family, as a church body, we echo their cry today. And as we enter into this time of worship this morning, if, if there's something going on in your life and you need to be prayed for, anointed with oil or anything like that, I would be honored to pray with you. Or we, we have people that would just be honored to do so today. But this is a moment right here that's routine. But don't let it be ordinary today. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much that we have the privilege and the freedom to worship. And Lord, I just pray this morning for your people. Lord, that worship so consistently and so regularly, but today I pray that there would be something that would rise up within them, that it would be beyond the ordinary. And Lord, it would be an extraordinary moment these next few minutes. Lord, help us to put everything aside right now. And Lord, we just seek you and we praise you and we worship you for who you are today. We proclaim it in your name, Jesus.